Tonight we come to a little book, one of the smallest books <coughs> in the Old Testament. The prophecy of a fellow named Habakkuk, or Habakkuk, or Habakkuk, <laughs> however you want to pronounce it. I pronounce it Habakkuk, that's the way I pronounce it. Uh, it's a very, the, the, his prophecy would be kind of obscure, except for the fact that in this little three-chapter prophecy, we find the foundation for what we believe as New Testament Christians. And you would think that some of the, some of the, some of the main tenets would come from the major prophets and, and some of the, you know, Moses and David and the Psalms and all these things. But in this little book of a guy with a funny name, who's just a very, a very brief prophecy, yet we find a foundation for our, what we believe about justification. Some people think that there's a difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament as to how to be saved. There are some differences because in the Old Testament, the fullness of God's revelation had not been accomplished in the cross. We look back on the cross. We look back on the fullness of the Godhead bodily in Jesus Christ. These Old Testament prophets look forward and just like many of the other prophets in Habakkuk, he, he saw God's plan as being, you know, we, we, we talked about standing on a mountain and looking at two other mountains. They look like they're right next to each other. But, of course, when you get there, you find out there's a big valley in between. The uh, Old Testament prophets really knew very little about what we call the church age, the time we're living in right now, the time between the, second, the first coming and the second coming of Jesus Christ. But... We know now, again, it has been revealed. It, it, Paul called it a mystery, the mystery of God's revelation in the church, the body of Christ. So uh, as we read through this prophecy, we're going to touch on some things that we're going to see. Is, 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 his prophecy is so important, even though it's small and it's kind of nestled in. And you've got to look at, sometimes you've got to look at the uh, table of contents to find out what page it's on. Habakkuk lived. He was a uh, prophet of Judah, probably lived about the time of Jeremiah. If you know anything about the time when Jeremiah lived, it was a time when, when Judah was, had uh, pretty much got to the edge of God's long-suffering. And God was preparing to send an enemy into Jerusalem. He was preparing to take his people captive because they had been disobedient to him. Uh, And Habakkuk, like many of us today, when you see the things going on around you, when you hear the things, uh, sometimes you get angry about unrighteousness, which is seeming to be, seeming, seeming to win. You know, the thing like with, with the Ten Commandments, you know, at, at school, and with all these other things going on, in, in, the, uh, in the world and things that we hear about. We're living in a nation, we're living in a time of ex just unrighteousness, a wicked and perverse generation. Now, this might not have a lot to do with the message, but I just got to get this off my chest. Okay. Now, how many remember when you were growing up, every time some kid didn't want to take a test, he'd make a phone call to the school and put in a bomb threat, right? You remember that? They did that, you know. And usually when that would happen, they would like shrug it off and say, yeah, some kid is, doesn't want to take his math test. Okay. This, uh, this really has nothing. Well, it does, but it doesn't. In the last month, there have been 60 bomb threats at Pitt University. 60. Either on the Internet. Now, they didn't have Internet when we were kids. And they didn't have caller ID either, so you could call them. But, and... And whenever they have one of these bomb threats, they empty the building out, and they put it on the news. And, now, you know, I'm not the brightest bulb in the bunch, but if it were me, and, and these bomb threats, I'm thinking, why do they keep putting it on the news? Now, now think about this. I'm, I just had to get this off my chest. I mean, why do they keep some, some, somebody out there is just really getting their kicks you know, every time they make a phone call or send an email through some kind of third or fourth party thing, and they watch the news and they find all these kids, they wake them up at 4 o'clock in the morning and get them out of the building. They say, let's stop putting it on the news. This is a time we're living in. People were like mixed up. They're mixed up. 
We're living in a wicked and perverse generation, just like Habakkuk. Now, they didn't have email and bomb threats and things like that back then. But it's the same kind of way. It's, 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 it's mixed up. There are violence is occurring in our streets that, you know, we're, we're hearing about people, shootings every day and every day, shootings going on, kids killing kids. Just, and when you hear these things and you hear the politicians and you hear the, about the corruption, it gets you angry. It makes you, makes you mad. That's what, what was going on with Habakkuk because Habakkuk was a righteous man living in an unrighteous generation. And the first few verses of this chapter 1, and, and to understand this book, you need to understand who's speaking because there's like a dialogue going on between Habakkuk and between the Lord. And the first few verses of Habakkuk, he registers not a complaint, but he registers his concern at what he sees going on. He says this in verse 1. He says, The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see, O Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? Did you ever feel like God's not listening? I remember one time we were, this was years ago, I was in a, a prayer meeting with a couple folks, and there was a young man there, and I can't remember his name. He was a good brother. And at that time, that was just at the beginning of, like, the gay liberation movement, okay? And, and there was, this was going on, I think, in New York City, they were going to pass an ordinance to recognize gay marriage, or whatever. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was, like, something like that. And the fella said, we need to pray against this. We need to really pray uh, against this happening. And I, I said, well, let's pray against it. But I said, listen, we can pray. But God's going to give the people what they want. You could pray. You know, we pray for righteousness in our nation. But if the people want unrighteousness, it's like praying for somebody that smokes three packs a day to get healed of, you know, emphysema. <laughs> it's like... You know, pray for them to get delivered from smoking, all right? We, you know, we need to pray for righteousness in our nation. There's, sometimes we, we try to bypass, we try to neglect the problem. The problem is we're living in the middle of a wicked and perverse generation. And Habakkuk, he was saying, Lord, aren't you hearing me? Because Habakkuk was a righteous man, and there were other righteous people who lived during that time, and they were praying, and they were seeking the Lord, and they were praying for, the, for, their, for their, uh, their, their king, and they were praying for uh, Israel. They, they, this was after the last good king of, the, of, of Judah was Josiah. After him, they were all wicked. And this was in the middle of all these wicked kings, and they were praying, and Habakkuk was praying, and he said, Lord, how long? Will you not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence, and you will not save. Lord, don't you see what's going on? Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are uh, that raise up strife and contention. Habakkuk is saying, Lord, I'm, look at all this stuff that's going on. How long are you going to let this go? Verse 4, therefore the law is slacked and judgment does never go forth, for the wicked does compass about the righteous, therefore wrong judgment proceeds. I mean, this is, could be today. They could put this in the Tribune Review. Because that's what's happening in our world. That's what's happening in our nation. Unrighteousness seems as though it's running out of control, unbridled. God gave Habakkuk an answer. And listen to what he said in verse 5. Behold ye among the heathen, and regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days which you will not believe, though it be told you. God says, you, you, you want me to do something? I'm going to do something. This, this was quoted, by the way, by, by the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts. When Paul was in Asia Minor in a synagogue and the Jews were rejecting his message, this is what he told them. He said, I'll, he says, if you want God to, God, sometimes we've got to be careful what we pray for. Habakkuk was saying, God, do something. And God's saying, okay, I'm going to do something. He said, here's what I'm going to do. He says in verse 6, For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, 
that bitter, those are the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar, that bitter and hasty nation which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. Their horses also are swifter than the leopards and are more fierce than the evening wolves, and their horsemen shall spread themselves, and their horsemen shall come from far. They shall fly as the eagle that hastens to eat. They shall come all for violence. Their faces shall sup up as the east wind, and they shall gather the captivity as the sand. And they shall scoff at the kings, and the princes shall be a scorn unto them. They shall deride every stronghold, for they shall heap dust and take it. Then shall his mind change, and he shall pass over and offend and pure this his power unto his God. He's saying, here's what I'm going to do, Habakkuk. I'm going to have the Babylonians come and conquer your nation. And they're going to come and they're going to brag that their God is stronger than I am. That's what God is speaking to Habakkuk. I'm going to have the heathen come, the enemy. People that don't know God, they worship other gods, they're wicked, they're evil. They're going to come. I'm going to have them destroy this city. That's pretty strong stuff. It's the same stuff he told to Jeremiah. He told Jeremiah to tell the people of Jerusalem, surrender to them. That's a pretty tough message. If somebody, God rose up a prophet in the United States and they said, surrender to Amah Benajab or whatever his name is. That's what, that's what essentially what was, was saying here. And, and God is saying, listen, you think I'm gonna, I'm, I haven't done anything yet? I'm, I'm going to, listen, when God sends his judgment, man, it's going to be, it's going to be heavy. It's going to be heavy. Because, you know, God's long-suffering. He's merciful. He'll give, you, he'll give everybody a long leash, but there's going to come a time when he's going to yank it back. And when he does, he told Habakkuk, he says, I've heard your prayer. I've seen the unrighteousness. I've seen this stuff going on. I've said this before. What's happening in this nation right now? You know, they want to take the plaques down and take the Ten Commandments down and they want to get God out of the schools. God's just given us what we've asked for. We've sowed to the wind, we're reaping the whirlwind. That's what Hosea said. And that's what was happening right here with the nation of Israel. Now, when Habakkuk heard that, okay, in verse 12, when Habakkuk heard that, he thought like, whoa, (laughs) you know. It was, it was like, well, maybe, God, you want to do that? Listen to what he says. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them for judgment, and O mighty God, you have established them for correction. You are of purer eyes than to behold evil, and cannot look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously? That's one page. They deal treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devours the man that is more righteous than he. In Habakkuk, he's saying, God, are you sure you want to use them? Isn't there some other way you can deal with this? <laughs> he says, and make men as the fishes of the sea and of the creeping things that have no ruler over them. They take up all of them with, their, with the angle. They catch them in their net. They gather them in their drag. Therefore, they rejoice and are glad. He's speaking of the wicked. Therefore, they sacrifice unto their net and burn incense unto their drag because by them their portion is fat and their meat plenteous. Shall they therefore empty their net and not spare continuously to slay all nations? He's saying, listen, why are you going to use the wicked to punish the wicked? Can't you think of something else to do, God? This is what Habakkuk is saying. You know, Habakkuk loved his nation. He loved his city. He loved his people. The thought of them being delivered into the hands of a heathen nation and led led away captive. But listen to what God says. Look at chapter 2. Habakkuk says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. Habakkuk is saying, okay, I'm going to watch. I'm going to go to the watch. You know, let me tell you something. People talk today about, and I, the other night, Brother D. Roy was sharing at the men's meeting about people that call themselves prophets. We all know today there's a prophetic, prophetic. People want to be prophetic and come up to you and tell you something, give you a little thing, a little word from God. 
I want to tell you something. A mark of a prophet, somebody that's called to be a prophet, is somebody that's willing to stand in the watchtower and get ready to take the hit for his people. Somebody that's going to stand in the gap, that's going to fill in the, the breach. The people want to, they want, they want to move in the quote-unquote prophetic. Well, are you willing to fill in the breach? Are you willing to stand in the gap? Habakkuk says, I'm going to, I'm going to, stand, I'm going to take my watchtower. And I'm going to hear what God has to say. And it says in verse 2, And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that, that reads it. You know, God's word is clear. His word about judgment, his word about forgiveness, his word about long-suffering, his word about chastisement, it's very, very clear. He never made it a mystery of how he feels about unrighteousness. He says in verse 3, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Now look at verse 4. Now, this is, now when we get to verse 4, this is, this is a verse that, that had stood as a foundation of what we believe about justification. Listen to what he says. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Buried in this obscure prophecy is a verse and a sentence that was used by the Apostle Paul to explain what it means to be saved. Now, somebody will say, well, in the Old Testament, salvation was different than the New. No, it wasn't. It's the same. We're saved by faith. The just shall live by his faith. This is how God can accept us. It's how God accepted them. It's how God accepts us. It's how God can accept anybody from Adam until the very last person that ever lives. It's by faith. Do you believe in God? Do you believe, not so much believe in God, but do you believe God? Because Paul used this in a couple different places. Romans chapter 1, verse 17, he says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. When he's talking about the gospel. In Galatians chapter 3, he says, But no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident, for the just shall live by, by faith. In Hebrews, now the just shall, uh, uh, chapter 10 and verse 38, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. The just shall live by faith. And in Hebrews, that's in chapter 10. What comes right after chapter 10 in Hebrews? Chapter 11. And chapter 11 is what? It's the faith chapter. People who live by faith. And you know, every example in chapter 11 about people who, you, who live by faith, did he, did he use Peter? Did he use Paul? Did he use the, the author of Hebrews? Did he talk about Barnabas or Stephen? Or Every example in chapter 11 of Hebrews is an Old Testament saint. Started with Abel. Talks about the righteous blood of Abel. He was saved by faith. He didn't know about the cross. He didn't know about the atoning blood. He understood about sacrifice because that's when he brought his offering. He sacrificed a lamb of the flock and he shed blood. He understood that. But I'm sure he didn't have a complete understanding of the, the, the theology of the New Testament. But he believed God. It was counted to him for righteousness. And all through the Old Testament, all those examples, Abraham, who is the ultimate example of salvation by faith, it says in Hebrews, when Abraham, when God told Abraham to take his son and offer him on Mount Moriah, you all know that story, don't it? When it said Abraham believed God, what did, did it say, well, Abraham knew God wasn't going to take his son? It didn't say that. It says that Abraham believed that God could raise him from the dead. Abraham fully expected to, to sacrifice his son. But he believed that God would raise him from He believed God, it was counted to him for Righteousness. So all these things, the just shall live by their faith. It means that the people who are, who are truly justified, the people who are really following God, who really believe God, their lives 
will have a mark on it. You'll be able to tell by how they live. The just shall live by their faith. James used Abraham, same example. And he said, you know what? Abraham, show me your faith without works. And I'll show you my faith by my works. Because James said, faith without works is what? Dead. Dead faith. Somebody gets saved. When somebody trusts in God, there's going to be a change. There's going to be something happen in their lives where they're going to begin to, to, to bear, the, bear the works. Bear the, the, their obedience is going to be like a, a, a sign to everybody around them. You know, we're justified by faith in God's eyes, but in man's eyes. See, it's one thing. People look, you know, if you say you're saved, we all know this. You say you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. People watch you. And they're going to find out if you're really saved. And you can tell them you're saved all you want to. You can quote scripture up and down. But if you go out there and, and talk like a heathen and act like a heathen and do all them things, they're just going to look at you and say, what kind of faith is that? What kind of salvation is that? The just shall live by their faith. The foundation of the Reformation, of everything we believe about salvation. We're saved by faith. Reading on just a little bit more. Also, it says in verse 5, he that transgresses by what? Uh, he is a... <laughs> by wine. He is a proud man, neither keeps at home, who enlarges his desire as hell, and is as death, and cannot be satisfied, but gathers unto him all nations, and heaps unto him all people. You know, when I used to drink, I could never get enough. And I wasn't an alcoholic. I wasn't. I, wasn't, I was not an alcoholic. But when I, I used to like, I didn't think I could have a good time unless I had a ball of beer and a joint. The way I figured. If I didn't have, if I didn't have both of them things, or at least one, <laughs> it was like, oh, what are we going to do tonight? We might as well stay home. Come, come on, you know what I'm talking about. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you don't. It's all right. If you don't, don't try to find out. Okay. Listen. Listen to what he says. Just, just reading what, and this is, this is descriptive of the time we're living in. Shall not all these take up a parable, this is verse 6, against him, and a taunting proverb against him, and say, Woe to him that increases that which is not his. How long? And to him that lays himself with thick clay. You know, people getting rich on other people's backs. Shall they not rise up suddenly that shall uh, bite thee and awake thee? Uh, that shall vex thee, and thou shalt be for booties unto them, because thou hast spoiled many nations. All the remnant of the people shall spoil thee, because of men's blood, and for the violence of the land, of the city, and of all that dwell therein. What he, Habakkuk is saying is what goes around comes around. It might look like folks are getting away with murder, and with money, and with robbery, and everything else, but everybody gets theirs. Apart from the, the blood of Jesus and apart from the mercy and the grace of God, you don't get away with anything. Nobody gets away with anything. Woe to him that covets an evil covets. Listen to all these things that he's talking about here. Well, we were talking before about the Ten Commandments and about... Woe to him that covets an evil covetousness to his house, that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the, the power of evil. Here he's talking about covetousness. Uh, uh, he, uh, he says, Thou hast consulted shame to thy house by cutting off many people. Thou hast sinned against thy soul. For thy stone shall cry out of the wall, and the beam out of the timber uh, shall answer it. Verse 12. Woe to him that builds a town with blood. I mean, he's describing the time we're living in right now. now he was describing his time. Don't, don't misunderstand me. He was writing about Judah in the time he was living in, and the wicked kings. But we could take these things he's saying right now and, and apply them to the time we're living. Because this, people are doing the same thing right now. And a lot of them are doing it in the name of Jesus. It's happening. He says, Behold, it is not of the Lord of hosts that the people shall labor in the very fire, and the people shall weary themselves for very vanity. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Thank the Lord. There's a time coming. God's going to, he's going to let everybody in the world know who he is. Habakkuk here is looking to the time when Jesus Christ is going to return. 
It says every eye will see him. Every eye will behold him when he comes back. Just reading a little bit more. We're just going to read through because I, I want to get to chapter 3 because chapter 3 is a good one. All right. <clears throat> Look at verse 15. Woe to him that gives his neighbor drink, <laughs> that puts the bottle to him and makes him, dr- makes him drunken, that thou mayst look on their nakedness. Hey, let's party. <laughs> I, I, you know. I, 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 I always I get very convicted because I'll see people that I knew years ago that I used to party with. When we were, you know, when we were young adults, kids. And, and, and uh, I thank God God had mercy on me. But I look at him, I feel kind of guilty. Because we used to, you know, I, I was, there were times that I was the protagonist. Okay. And, and, and you look and you say, and you pray for him. So, Lord, you know, I got him started on it. I wish I could get him started on this. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, drop down, uh, just look at verse 18. What profits the graven image that the marker, that the maker thereof has graven it, the molten image and the teacher of lies that the maker of his work trusts there? You know what I was watching today? I, I was, I, I, there's a program on the Science Channel. It's called Through the Wormhole. Anybody ever watch that program? If you're of it. Morgan Freeman, you know Morgan Freeman. He's like the he's like the uh, MC, and it's 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 a it's a program that talks about uh, the universe and physics and you know the mysteries of science and so forth. And there was a guy on there today when, it, when the program they had on today. I was watching. I didn't watch the whole thing, but they were talking about creation. They said you know they were talking about. Uh, the beginning, and they talked. They talked about God. Now they don't believe in God, but they said this one guy was on there, and I, this guy probably ought to be in a hospital somewhere. He said, he said, well, you know, he was talking about how computers are every every uh, I think sixteen months they double the capacity of the computing capacity. Okay, and. You know, it's getting to the point now where they finally got a computer that is, actually has more uh, computing capacity than the human brain. The human brain is a very remarkable thing. <laughs> but every 10 months or every 12 months or every 16 months, they double their capacity. So he said, in 50 years, we'll have computers that will be able to, to, to create virtual reality. Now, now, this is what this guy was saying. And this, this is so weird. But, 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 he was saying that he believes that we're all living in a video game. I'm not making it up. This, that God was really a, you know, a, a big, a massive computer somewhere, and we're just kind of like all, pro, it's like virtual reality. He said, if you're not looking at it, it doesn't exist. So that means while I'm looking at you, the, the garage behind the place don't exist. It don't exist unless I'm looking. And that's what these people are saying. That's how sick they've gotten. That's how crazy they've gotten because they don't want to believe in God. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, they, they've, cre- they've created idols. You know, now we don't have wood idols and golden idols like they used to have. They would bow down to. But now we have virtual image idols. And we've actually gotten to the point where they, they're looking for a time when they'll actually be able to implant uh, artificial intelligence in people. <laughs> well, some of us have artificial intelligence to begin with. But, but, and, 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 and people will be like half human, half, half computer. So it'll increase. And this is, what, this is what these people want to do. They're playing God. And essentially, here's what the guy said. He said, eventually, in another 50 years or 100 years, we can all be like gods. That's what he said. I mean, I don't know why I watch this stuff. I'm fascinated with people's stupidity. I'm thinking, you fool, don't you know there's a God in heaven that spoke everything into existence, and now you're, you, know, you think it's a video game? He didn't. We're not like Pac-Man, you know. Okay, anyway. Now listen, all right. Look at verse 19. We're a few more minutes and we're going to be done. Verse 19. Woe unto him that says to the wood, Awake, 
to the dumb stone arise. You know, pre- people, just imagine people that worship idols. You go get a piece of wood and make a statue out of it. Then you pray to it. The only thing is, is living in that woods, maybe a couple termites. You know, there's nothing. It can't do anything for you. But that's what, that's what idolatry is. Uh, Awake to the dumb stone. Arise, it shall teach. Uh, behold, it is laid over with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in the midst of it. It can't even breathe. What's it going to do for you? But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let him, all the earth, keep silence before him. So here's Habakkuk. He comes to this conclusion in his prophecy. God's going to do what he wants to do. He's, what he wants to do is right. And if we don't worship him, we can expect judgment to come. If you live in a nation that has turned his back on God, judgment is going to come. God will use the worst heathen. He'll use the most ungodly to bring chastisement and judgment to his people. And he's right to do so because he's God. And I'll tell you what, the way this, the, the things we're hearing and the way this world's going... Okay, chapter 3 is the good one. Because in all this, and this is where we need to be as believers, we don't need to be afraid of what's going on in the world. We don't need to be angry because, you know, what they do in Washington or Harrisburg. We don't need to be angry. We don't need to pound our fists and watch Fox News and kick the table. We don't need to be doing all that stuff. Because that's what Habakkuk was doing. They didn't have Fox News. But listen to what he says. A prayer, chapter 3 is a song. Habakkuk decided he was going to write a song. When he found all this out, when God showed him he was going to take care of everything, that everybody's going to get theirs, he's going to take care of the wicked, he's going to establish his kingdom, Habakkuk wrote a song. Listen to what he says in the song. Oh Lord, I've heard your speech and was afraid. Oh Lord, Revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known. In wrath, remember mercy. In wrath. Listen, God's going to send his wrath. He's going to send his judgment. He's going to send all this. But even in that, God has mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. God came from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran. Paran. His glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out of his hand and there was uh, uh, the hiding of his power. Before him went the pestilence and burning coals went before his feet. He stood and measured the earth. He beheld and drove asunder the nations and the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills did bow. His ways are everlasting. This is our God. I saw the tents of cushion in affliction, and the curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Was the Lord displeased against the rivers? Was thine anger against the rivers? Was thy wrath against the sea, that thou didst ride upon thine horses and thy chariots of salvation? Thy bow was made quite naked, according to the oaths of the tribes, even thy word. You did cleave the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you, and they trembled. An overflowing of the water passed by, and deep uttered his voice, and lifted up his hands on high. The sun and the moon stood in their habitat. And the light of your arrows, they went, and at the shining of thy glittering spear. I mean, our God's a powerful God. Nothing will stand before him. The earth won't stand before him. Mountains won't stand before him. Kingdoms won't stand before him. You did march through the land in indignation. See, these folks, we have to understand we have a God who is loved, but we have a God who gets angry. He is indignant. Remember it says in Psalm 2? Why did the heathen rage? People imagine of anything. What does it say? The Lord laughed in indignation at their foolishness. You went forth for the salvation of your people. I'm just going to read here down because... Verse 17 is the good one. Uh, you went forth for the salvation of your people, even for salvation with your anointed. You, would, uh, you wound, wounded the head out of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation unto the neck. Now, there's a lot right there, but we're just going to... Thou didst strike through with the staves, uh, the head of his villages. They came out as whirlwind to scatter me. The, the rejoicing was to devour the poor secretly. You did walk through the sea with your horses... 
through the heap of great waters. When I heard, my belly trembled. Man, sometimes when you realize what's going on in this world, it kind of makes you get that sinking thing in your stomach. You know what I'm saying? My lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered into my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he comes up unto the people, he will evade them with his troops. Here is Habakkuk. He's sitting in Jerusalem. He realizes that the enemy is coming to destroy this city. And can you just imagine what he was feeling? But he says this, and we're going to close with this. And I hope you take this with you. Because when you read the papers and, and hear the bad news, North Korea wants to launch a missile, and this one does this, and they've got uh, uh, reactors in Iran. You know, it doesn't matter. Why? Because though the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail, fail and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. When the stock market crashes, when the mills shut down, when I get laid off, when gas goes up to 10 bucks a gallon, when, I mean, fill in the blank. When all this horrible stuff happens, how are we going to act? Here's the just that lives by faith. Here's what he says. Yet I will, what? Rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Regardless of what's going on around us, see, it's going to happen. We can't stop it. It's going to happen. But see, here's the thing. It's all right. You better know that you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, because if you do, when it happens, see, there are folks uh, they, they call them, now there's, there, there are people they call preppers. Ever, ever hear of preppers? See, when I, when I was a kid, preppy meant something different. Okay. But now the preppers are these people that's like amassing great amounts of food and finding, getting places where they can, when, when uh, the stuff happens, they can go hide with, you know, seven years worth of food. You can buy it for 3000 bucks and get seven years worth of food. <laughs> of Jimmy Baker, right? The preppers are getting everything ready. And there's nothing wrong with, you know, I mean, I think we all have a retirement and so forth. I mean, that's, that's a good thing to lay something aside for when you get old. That's, that's important. But, you know, when God sends judgment, he's going to take care of his. He's going to take care of his. I don't got to go out and spend five, seven years worth of dried food and stick it in my cellar. I'm going to be able to cook it anyhow. They're selling dry food. They're selling, you know, uh, sunscreen generators. They're selling stuff. I mean, you know, and people, it's just, they had all this stuff left over from back in Y2K. Remember that? <laughs> they didn't sell all the stuff back then, so they've got to sell it now. Okay. He says, the Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds feet. And he will make me to walk upon my high places. All this stuff can go on, but God's my strength. And that's the message of Habakkuk. The just shall live by their faith. When things are going good, when things are going bad, when the enemy's pounding at the door, when things are failing, when the job moves south, when all this stuff goes on, he's still our God. There's a song we used to sing, praise the Lord, hallelujah. I don't care what the devil's going to do. The word of faith is my sword and shield. And Jesus is Lord of the way I feel. Is he your Lord this evening? You don't got to be afraid of nothing. Amen? Praise the Lord. Why don't you stand with me as we close?